Hello. Normally I cover audio and video technology on this channel, but sometimes we do some other electronics as well. And I do other things as well, you know. I'm not just always in the studio and workshop. I go to the gym. And after I've had a good gym workout, I will spend 20 minutes on a massage chair they have upstairs. But I've not been able to do that for a few weeks because it's broken down. And it can't be repaired. They're having to order a new one in. So uh, it's going to get junked. Always wanted a massage chair. These things are really expensive, you know. This one cost around about £9,000 when it was new, admittedly about eight years ago, but it's still worth good money if it could be repaired. But could anybody repair this? It weighs like well over 100 kilograms, really hard thing to move. No idea how you'd fix it, but apparently the problem is it's completely dead. Shall we try? For the time being I've had to put this in the hallway, it's so enormous I can't uh, put it anywhere else in the house to work on it. So uh, it's going to be a bit of a challenge, even if I can fix it, where would I put this in the house? Uh, uh, oh, oh, uh... Oh my! What junk have you collected now? That uh, is enormous! Um... Where on earth do you think this is going to go? Um... We don't have room for it? Um... The tip, maybe? No, 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 I'll fix it. Having manhandled this thing uh, back home, and that was extremely hard, believe me, because it weighs about 120 kilograms, uh, I've had to plonk it temporarily in a hallway because I can't easily get it through a door. We'll tackle that problem later. Let me first show you what the uh, symptoms are. So it's powered, well, it's plugged in now. So there's uh, power to the socket at the back. What should happen when we switch it on is the display here should come on even before you press the power button and select what uh, function you want. So we uh, flick the switch to on and absolutely nothing at all. It's totally dead. So I'm hoping it may be a power supply problem. First thing first, how do we get it apart? Feels like there's a big module in here. You see that when I wiggle it, the power switch sort of wiggles with it. And there are some screws at the back here. So I'm going to shot at taking them out and see if this plastic lid maybe comes up. Uh, if that doesn't work, I don't know what has to be done to uh, gain access to this, but we'll have to try and find out. I'm assuming these are the screws I should be working on, not these great big ones down here. Okay. And our first look inside the machine. So we have a big control board on the left there, but crucially, a power supply, a self-contained power supply on the right. So I want to see if we're getting any voltages out of that. Uh, there's also an enormous transformer, well, fairly enormous. Uh, does that power supply all come out? So we have two cables, one here to the main board and another one here to the main board. So I could unplug those but there's no way of taking all this out. It looks like it might come out because it all wobbles, but it's actually just because it's mounted on this chassis. So I'd have to take everything out and I don't know how to take this panel out. It may be screwed in from underneath. Yes, it is. Uh, that's screwed in from underneath, which is inaccessible to me. Uh, fairly inaccessible. <laughs> because the whole machine is sat down there. So I can feel the screws. Maybe I could get a right angle screwdriver in there. That would be um, just a possibility. And then I could take this off. But uh, I wonder if I can make some measurements in situ. There's a connector here going to what I believe is the transformer. And a big bundle of cables here, which will be going to the switch the input and might also go to the transformer. 
the two pin one there. Marked AC100. So that might be a high voltage connection. And then this multi way connector here, which will obviously carry all the lower voltages. So I'm guessing there won't be any voltages on that. If it is a power supply fault, then we won't have any voltages on that. The colour coding is non existent. They've kind of done it in rainbow colour fashion. So there are no clues there as to what voltage might be what. That's a shame. I'll have to work out which one's ground. I could do that by unplugging it and see which of these are connected to the chassis. I suspect it's that first pin there, which is actually pin 8. But there may be others. So I can see what looks like a ground plane in there. Let's do some measurements and then look at voltages on here. If there are voltages on there, we're probably in trouble because it's not going to be a simple, relatively simple power supply problem. All right, let's make a few uh, DC measurements. Right, I'm going to make the assumption that ground is zero volts, which of these, if any, are ground. None of them. Okay, that could be a false assumption then. Let's assume that this large area here is a ground plane. Well, it might not be. It could be power, couldn't it? What can we find in here that we can be fairly sure is ground? I'm going to have to assume that this track here is, is the ground plane. No, none of them. Taking a step back for a second, I see that there's a high rupture current fuse there. Oh, it's definitely worth testing that, isn't it? Right, let's test this fuse. Here goes. The fuse is fine. With very few clues to go on, I'm just going to make some uh, DC measurements between pins. See if I can find any voltages on here. Minus 20 volts there. Minus 16 there, and that's even when it's switched off. Yep, there are voltages. I don't have a ground point, obviously, but there are voltages. It's become apparent that the reason we have an AC connector there, and we then have a rectifier, and lots of capacitors, including some high voltage ones, it's obvious that part of the power supply is on the main board here. So I've had some fairly inconclusive results trying to measure voltages on here, which is from the power supply. Fairly sure that's AC, so that's not going to tell us terribly much. But what else do we have? We've got something called sub. Don't know what sub is, but Remo. Aha. That's going to be out to the remote control unit. You know, that thing. I reckon that should do something if there's any power on here. So let's meter this out, see if we can find any voltages on there. And if so, check the other end in case it's a cable fault. Right, we have the usual problem that we have no idea where ground would be on this remote connector. Because I've just done the colours in a sort of sequence. So I'll just have to meter between pins, but let's see what we get. I'm looking for something like 5 volts between any two pins. I don't believe there is. Well, what's sub? We don't know where that goes, but if we only have four connectors going through to the remote control end, then we know 
we're not getting powered. So that helps quite a lot. Let's have a look at the remote control end. So here it is. If I just uh, take the back off, see if we have the same four colours as we have here, and if so, this is not being powered. Fund on the uh, five screws. The cable here does not have the same set of colours as this connector, so there may be a junction point somewhere. Let's see if they meter out though so that they are connected. Okay, so they're all making contact and we know we're not getting any voltages there. But this might help us work out where ground is. By far and away, the biggest amount of these areas here are all connected together and to this pin here, which is that one. Pin one of Remo. I'm sure that's ground. We've finally worked out where ground is. Is that here as well? No, you see, the big areas in here are not the ground. But no, uh, never mind. So that looks to be the ground point on this power supply. That's 0.9 ohms there. 0.4. I'm going to take it that green there is ground from the power supply. So we can use that as our ground point to make our voltage measurements. And we know also that we don't have any voltages on here relative to that point. So we'll just double check there, but now we're fairly sure that that pin one is, is our ground point, our zero volts point, to be more accurate. Uh, we can use that to make some measurements. I'm gonna reassemble this because I really don't think there's a fault with this. And with uh, that being ground, I believe, why should we use that as ground? A little bit harder to get to that point, but armed with that one being ground, let's make some measurements on the power supply connector. I just need to make very sure I've made good contact there. Right, let's go through the remote and the power supply connectors again. Thirteen and a half volts, that's ground. Oh no it isn't. That might be. 10 volts, 13, 35, okay, minus half a volt, minus 0.4 of a volt, a bit weird that they're negative voltages. So having gone from assuming that it wasn't a power supply fault, I'm thinking now it could be a power supply fault, maybe there should be a, a 5 volt rail somewhere. Hmm. That's a possibility, isn't it? I'm starting to think I need to take the power supply out, which is not going to be easy, but take it out and see if I can do some DC tests. But taking out the transformer as well is going to be a little hard, because that's mounted on this panel that I can't get to. But taking the power supply out should be possible. It seems to be held with standoffs here to squeeze these and pop out, hopefully. Might depend how this is mounted. If that heatsink is mounted on the main panel, then we're going to be in trouble. Definitely at the point, it's worth checking the... Uh, just do some DC tests here and see if we can work out where the 5 volts should be. My guess is it's probably the green connector there. Yes, OK, let's uh, try and take this out. Well, you know what? I think I'll let the voltages die down because there's some big volts on there. Uh, I think I'll just let that uh, fade away before I start uh, disconnecting anything. Access to uh, some of these connectors is really not very good. I need to remember to plug them all back in again afterwards. So we've got the one at the back, which is the multi-way DC one we've been working on the other end. We've got the AC to this point here. We've got a multi-way connector here, which goes into this loom but I believe it goes to the transformer and another one from the loom here at the side. We may have everything disconnected, no, ah, we've got a set along here. 
Is it a set or big one big connector? Several smaller ones in a sequence. You would hope that they can't be plugged in the wrong sockets, wouldn't you? But those back two look identical. It's a bit scary. So the one with the black and white wires goes to the very back. That's a little bit scary. Right, we should have everything unplugged from the power supply, so I need to uh, squeeze the plastic PCB standoffs, and hopefully that will allow us to uh, release the PCB. Actually, this transformer is screwed down from this side, so I might take the transformer out to give myself better access to getting the PCB out. Right, with the transformer out, I can now see a little more. And though the PCB is held, is, has got um, releasable clips here, the heat sink appears to be mounted to the chassis somehow. I had wondered what these screws were for, and I think I now know. You undo those, and you can withdraw this whole thing. So, uh, make my life a bit easier. Take these screws out. There's one at the other end. and I can pull this out. There are some sort of clips here I need to release in order to get this out. Ah, there may be more big screws down there that you can't see next to these plastic bits. That's a nuisance. Trying to work out how things are assembled at the back and I just can't see. So uh, I'll use my uh, handy Parkside inspection camera. There's um, huh. I've made a profit. There's a screw there, which is mount, which is I think. What I'm trying to work out is whether that's connected to the chassis or this clip that holds the top on. It looks like I need to undo that screw. I think. But there's another one back here and it's not obvious which is the one I need to undo. Even when I can see it, I still can't work it out. It's covered in dust. Only trouble is those screws are done up super tight. They're big screws and I just can't shift them. So I've been having a bit of trouble with these bolts. Because there's some bolts holding the whole chassis in. I really can't get to it. Well. I used my endoscope, or whatever you call it, my C round corners thing. So there we are. It wasn't such a mistake to buy that at all. So I found a way I can put this screwdriver on the stuck screw bolt, but then I can't turn it. They must have assembled it when this chair wasn't in the way. But if I put this on it, then I can turn it. So this, these are what are called pipe grips. You can adjust the closing of them. So if ever you wonder what pipe grips are, that's what they are. Every household should have them. It's not just a geeky thing, it's for, you know, when you have a house, you should, certain tools you'll need. What's that, Scott? Good morning. Right, here goes. I'm hoping that this whole tray will come out. Oh, well, moves a little bit. Gives me access to underneath. I probably will have to unplug all the connectors. Oh no, it's worse than that. Unplugging the connectors alone won't help because they're clamped down here. Oh boy. But I can get to the underneath just about, so I hopefully can release this uh, heat sink. I could take the opportunity to remove this and that would give me better access. Right, I have way better access to this now. 
I should be able to release these um, PCB mounts. Oh, that's got that's got more PCB holders right under the power under the heatsink. I cannot release these clips, so I think I'm just going to have to cut them off because I can't get the power supply out with those in place. Okay, we have the power supply out. I really struggled with the uh, PCB mounts there. I had to cut them off. But uh, now we can get this uh, on the workbench and maybe do some measurements. It's just a simple linear supply. Even though we don't have the transformer with it, I reckon we can uh, just use a DC supply and uh, feed the input to the rectifiers and see where the voltages are. So I'll get you looking down on it so you can get a better view. Right, let's just take a visual look. There's something interesting going on here, some sort of factory modification. But basically we have a 7805A regulator there, a transistor 2SC, I think, I can't read it, 41 something, transistor there, uh, and a, another regulator there, that one's 7815. Okay, and some chokes and capacitors and rectifiers. And there's our fuse that we've already tested. Let's uh, study the circuit a little bit. We know these are the outputs. This TRS, I think that is the transformer. These, I suspect, are outputs. or interconnects between things. Yeah, that's all that is. They're just interconnects. That's why it doesn't matter which of those goes where, because all they do is link together. This is the uh, mains input side, I think, and it goes through chokes and capacitors, and then off to the transformer via one of the other connectors. That one, I think. So we can ignore that side of it. This is the bit that we're interested in here. It looks very hot and bothered over here. Now I was thinking that, I think we decided that green was ground and that blue should be five volts. I think that's the way it is. And that's the five volt regulator there. And the pinout on the five volt regulator, I think is Input, ground and output. So this link they've added appears to be on the ground track and it just connects. It's like it's extra current capability. Maybe it was burning up on some of these. So that's ground. Ah yes. Yep, go with that. That's input. Right, which is also fed out to this connector and output I think it's on that third pin and we also have this regulator uh, it looks like the transistor feeds the 5 volt regulator and the transistor itself is fed from the 15 volt regulator ok we have some rectifiers and smoothing capacitors. So we have, it looks like, a winding here and a winding here for the transformer. One goes to this rectifier and one goes to this one. This then goes to smoothing capacitors, which are 25, or one smoothing capacitor at 25 volts. And then links straight to some outputs. So that's unregulated. So our interesting one is likely to be this then. Yep, that's earth. Of the rectifier goes to capacitors, yes. Okay, I've got a little under 20 volts for my power supply. It's current limited to just a few hundred milliamps. Let's uh, connect that up. There's a little spark then from the uh, capacitor charging up. So we have capacitors at 18 volts, and this is ground here on the right. So this regulator here 
15 volts output. 18 in, 15 out. And then our 5 volt regulator. 15 in, 5 volts out. Well that's looking good. There's not a fault there. So why was I not seeing that on the unit itself? I wasn't getting 5 volts. Have we got an overload on the 5 volt line? I was kind of half expecting that 5 volt regulator to be burnt out. But let's take a note of which colour is which voltage. OK, I've proven that there are no faults. Well, fairly much proven that there are no faults with a power supply. That's somewhat strange result, but um, I thought I was going to have a fault with the regulator, but seemingly not. So why are we not getting those voltages at the uh, at the unit? Maybe there's an overload on the five volt rail. We'll uh, look into that. Okay, let's make some measurements now that I've refitted the power supply but not connected it to the equipment at all. We now know that the green connector is ground, so we should make some measurements. I'll set myself up for that. Okay, switch it on. Unregulated, yes. I guessed about 20 volts. There we should have 5 volts, yes we have. Uh, 13 volts, yes we do. About 14.3, yes we do, and unregulated, oh, it was about 35, I was guessing. Okay. So we now know that the power supply is working and what voltages we should get on it. Let's reconnect to the main system now. And now we should be able to detect our 5 volts between the green and the blue. And if we don't, then we know there's a problem. I made a mistake there. Between the green and the yellow. Almost nothing. So we have an overload on the 5 volt line. Let's unplug the remote here and whatever sub is and see if that overload goes away. Nope. So that's eliminated a lot. So it's likely on the main board here. What else can we unplug? About more or less everything. So whatever that, is, whatever that connector is, I've unplugged. And then one next to it. There's an enormous ribbon cable here. I'll come to that one later. I've unplugged these two. Let's see if our overload has gone away. Not yet, no. It's going to be on the main board, isn't it? These, are, these connectors here are going to be drive to the motors, I should think. I'd be surprised if they carry five volts. This might well do. Okay, just a giant IDC connector. Unplug that. That's our five volt line now. Still not there. It's gonna be on the main board. Okay, let's unplug the remaining connectors then. Okay, I've unplugged everything by the power supply connector, I believe. Short circuits on the main board. Unplug that, and five volts. So we have a short circuit on the main board. It's likely to be, well, I'm guessing. It could be an IC, could be a capacitor if we're really lucky. So I've got to try to squeeze all these, connect, these uh, PCB holders and get that board out. Well, that's not exactly good news, is it? The fault is somewhere on here. I mean, maybe I can find out where the fault is by looking at uh, how low the resistance is across the 5 volt rail as I go through the various tracks. But if it's almost any IC on here, I'm going to be stuffed. But, you know, let's uh, persevere. I could really use a thermal imaging camera here because I could put 5 volts on and see what gets hot. But I don't have one. So uh, let's uh, do some investigations. So between ground, which is here, and yellow, the next one along, that's 5 volts, there appears to be a short circuit. So let's just confirm that. 
Yeah, it's half an ohm. <laughs> that is an extremely good short circuit, that. So, are we going to be able to uh, isolate where that is? I need to measure very, very low ohms uh, looking on the board for this short circuit. That's my uh, probe resistance. I'm running in two-wire mode. I don't have a suitable four-wire. So I'm using a high-quality multimeter here with more resolution than an ordinary one. So I can go down onto the board and look for the lowest possible resistance between paths looking for this 5 volt short. And I might be getting somewhere, so uh, let me do some uh, work off camera and see if I can find where the short might be. So what I'm measuring is between the uh, input ground here and 5 volts, so I've got these sharp probes which are really handy for this, I'm measuring about 0.48 ohms. But if I head over here, I'm getting 0.46 something ohms. She says I'm getting closer. There's a small capacitor here. Well, actually about 0.47. And there's a Zener diode here. 0.46. So it says to me that one of these three components may be at fault, because if I move further over here, further along the board, it goes up to 0.48. So that really does indicate that it could be in this area. Let's uh, see if we can desolder these components. It's a dirty workaround. I might just snip the wire on that uh, xenodiode. Oh my, just checking across the Xena with it disconnected, it's fine. <laughs> Xena died short circuit. That's the fault. Right, so that's the diode I've just taken out. Uh, I'm going to obtain a replacement. The nearest I have at the moment is a very subtly different voltage. That's 5.2 volts. This is 5 point something, uh, 5.6 I think. Uh, it actually seems to break down, I've done it on a power supply with very low current limit. It breaks down just under 6 volts. So I'll fit that temporarily while I, while I order the proper one. But why does it even have it? So looking at the, the circuit diagram, thinking about what the circuit diagram is, we had 13, point, 13 volts I think in from a regulator. And then we had the 5 volt regulator, the 7805. To ground and 5 volt out and various capacitors in various places then this goes via the interconnection cable um, to so remember there's the green and yellow wires here to this main board here and the first thing it does well you have some capacitors we have a couple of capacitors there. So an electrolytic and and uh, a ceramic one. And then Xena diode. 5.2 volts. So uh, why? Well, presumably if this went over voltage for some reason, which they don't have a habit of doing, then this would be the final uh, protection to the whole board. But is that good? Because this is only a tiny little diode. It couldn't dump the one amp that can come from this regulator. Well, the failure mode for these is they go short circuit, like it has. So if this started dumping loads of current, it would go short circuit and protect the rest of the board. That might imply, then, that our regulator has failed, but I've measured it, and it's absolutely fine. So it seems more likely that there was just a random failure. Possibly the uh, voltage on this was starting to fall very slightly, and it just got to the point 
that it was starting to take a little bit of current and then it got hotter and hotter and hotter and it got into a thermal runaway situation because there's no resistor anywhere so it's just going to dump the entire output from that if this uh, starts to starts to conduct so you could argue I don't need that component at all I don't actually think I do that's why I'm happy temporarily to put a 5.6 volt di diode in there until I can get the correct one uh, you know it's a bit of a marginal component and I'm sure the system would work fine without it but let's fit the diode I've got uh, and then I can reassemble it all and test it. Right, I'm going to refit the main board temporarily. I'm not going to refit everything because I still need to change that diode for the correct type. But uh, for now, we can pop this in and test it. Right, let's go for the test. So I promise this is the first time I've tested it. The big clue will be whether that uh, display comes on. So I'll switch it on now. Nothing. How can that be? Let's check that five volt line there. So between green and yellow we're looking for 5 volts if I've done everything right one volt have I fitted that diode back to front I'm thinking I might take that diode out okay let's do that again with the uh, diode removed, look for 5 volts. 5 volts. Go up here. Ready. Looking good. Align body along the back of the chair and rest your head on the pillow. What did you do It appears that I was wrong. It is not a 5.2 volt Zener. That is not a standard voltage anyway. It's, I think that's not a 5. 
to warn six. So it's 6.2 volts. That's a diode that I need to obtain. I mean, you can argue that it's not needed anyway, but I'm going to obtain a replacement 6.2 volt Zener. What wattage do you think this is? Let's see if we can get a one watt, I think. Well, we've manhandled this thing into the room with terrible wallpaper and uh, matching curtains, all very 1990s. And that's relevant, of course, because at some point we'll need to decorate and we'll have to take this out again. But right now, let's concentrate on fixing it. So the diodes have arrived, so I need to decide now whether I'm going to fix it in situ or take the electronics pack out. So uh, I'll make a start and make a decision. So the diode in question is just next to this connector here. And I'd snipped it because I think I fitted it the wrong way around, carelessly. Uh, I'd convinced myself that it was the wrong way round on the diagram, but no, it's not on the markings. So uh, can I solder in there or should I take it into the uh, workshop? I think I could probably do it there. Yeah, let's do it in situ if I can. Right, I think I've done a reasonable job of soldering that diode on there. I know you should, you know, really take the whole board out and desolder from the pads, but uh, rather than go through all that hassle, I've desoldered it on the top. This is a one watt diode, so it's got fairly thick leads compared to the original, so that's all very stable. If that all works properly, I can do the final reassembly, including the cable clamps and all the bits and pieces at the back here. I'm a lot happier now that diode's in place, even though I didn't really know why it was there in the first place. Uh, it's good to know it's there now. So uh, let's do all the uh, reassembly, including the big set of screws that go down the back here that were so hard to uh, get out. I have to refit these big bolts that go into those back locations that are so hard to see and line up. But uh, difficult though it is, I really should fit them. Okay, Mrs. Video 99, uh, try my new uh, massage chair. So uh, that's how we switch it on. And uh, I put some labels on here because it was a bit unclear which is back. So lie back. Off you go. And we'll select one of the programs. It does a thing where it's supposed to find the shoulders and has a habit of being too high. Yeah, it sets that way too high. It's done that for years, so just lower that down to the shoulders and then goes from there. What do you think, Mrs? Mm -hmm. Okay, I suppose. Also, it can do this great thing where it um, squeezes your feet, air pressure things in the bottom. quite good. Maybe you're forgiven. Oh good, I'm glad about that. You can get into the situation where it's powered up but the display's off and you don't know if the machine's on or off and there's no indicators. So uh, I fitted a LED here to indicate that it's on but I deliberately chose a particular kind of LED that quite closely matches the original LEDs on the unit. So it has very much the same sort of uh, aesthetic. It's a flat topped, small green LED with a very similar aesthetic to the LEDs that are on there. Uh, and when Mrs. Video 99 first saw that, uh, she thought it was a uh, factory install. So uh, it's very much in keeping with the machine.
these are the labels I put on because up and down the ink the the incline up and down kind of go the opposite way around to what the arrows do so uh, I've put those labels on just to make it clear I've often felt with this that the uh, back cushion is uh, not supportive enough so uh, what I do is just stick an extra cushion in there in fact we're going to buy a black one to uh, to match this and maybe velcro it up to the top just to give a little bit more support at the back there's a bit of wear in some of the material here as well so I'm going to do some, some minor repairs with um, some PVC uh, material and badge glue which is really good at gluing things together like this there's an extra feature of this thing which I suspect very few people use you open a little panel and a joystick pops out and you can control uh, your own sequences on it and you can store them as well but all the time this thing was at the gym I don't think I ever saw anyone use this I'm sure it's a feature that cost a lot of extra money to add but really wasn't used very much now I hope you've enjoyed us working on this it's well out of my normal sort of area but it was an interesting fault finding process uh, when it was within its service life, because the manufacturer would support them for six years after the end of manufacture, if you'd had a fault like that, you'd have called somebody out and they'd have replaced the entire main control board, which would have cost a lot of money. But after six years, the manufacturer don't support it anymore, and it just becomes a dead loss. So going down to a component level on a, on a fault like this, I think was a, a particularly interesting repair. Normally, of course, I repair audio and video equipment, like this lovely, obscure piece of equipment here. And I'll be working on plenty more of that sort of thing shortly. So if you think that might be of interest to you and you're not already a subscriber, have a look at my outro and you see some of the sort of things I work on. Now, of course, I'd like to say a big thank you to Royston and all the great people uh, who work at uh, Fort Stamford Health and Fitness Club in Plymouth. It was great of them to let me have this uh, piece of equipment and to help me get the thing out as well. Really good team there. So if you're in the Plymouth area, I'd highly recommend Fort Stamford. Do join me shortly as I work on all kinds of interesting audio and video equipment. Bye for now.